चलो talk today a little bit about uh, basketball and Olympics. So we'll try to go through the concepts of how analytics is used. We will mostly start how it is used currently in the NBA, but some of the trends or a lot of the trends that you'll see today are coming to Europe or some of them are already used. And in tomorrow's session, the, the ones that will be in the session, we will see it in live. What, can, what of the which concept that you will see today can be translated, for example, to the European game, be it uh, female, be it male, basketball, it doesn't matter which level of competition. Um, before we start, what I do, mostly analytics, I write, I write or do analytical analysis for a magazine uh, in Dallas about Dallas Maverick. So I write about uh, their team performance through data, film, and analysis, so mostly analytical concepts about that. Otherwise, we were talking before with Laszlo, I have a, let's say, strange background, work in IT, marketing, e-commerce, uh, now also uh, basketball, but it was always with, let's say, analytical mind or analytical approach. And a lot of the concepts, the more you study and you will see some of the things, data science that is coming in all areas of our lives, uh, same concepts are applied in all industries. Uh, industries that I talk, uh, talked about, that I learned, same concepts, same algorithms, same principles are applied, be it things so different as marketing on one side or basketball on the other side. Uh, we'll try to go through this introduction, through trends, so anything, if anything in the middle, just ask, so we don't need to be very strict. I hope you will see some of the things because the fonts are small. If you don't, just ask or come closer. Um, okay, so this is the plan. And the first part is something that we will try to cover today for the most part. So we'll try to go from the evolution of the analytics, how this evolved, where did it come from, how did it come to basketball, what is happening now, what are the latest trends. So this although some of the concepts might not be applicable to you currently, but just have an open mind what may come. So if you will see some of this concept later on, you will know. So I think this is more like, let's say, futuristic overview of where the sport is going. Uh, the second part is how this developed and what are the key data sources or the key things. And then we will already talk about the application of how this can be found, for example, also in European basketball. Um, and then we have two cases or two demos we will see. Maybe we'll start with the NBA case today, if we will have time, otherwise tomorrow. But I will show you some of these platforms in action. So we will see the, the things that we are using that I will talk about. You will see them live, how we can use and we can talk and we, you can see if it makes sense or not. And tomorrow the idea is, because as I said, these things after today could sound a little bit futuristic. And I always get the comment, oh, this is great, but this is NBA and we are like 20 years behind. 
as I said, tomorrow we'll try to be pragmatic. We'll try to see, can some of these concepts be used today with what you have or with what you might have? So this is the, the key goal for tomorrow. Try to see how this can help on European basketball data, on European clubs, on European basketball. Make sense? Okay. Any questions? No? Okay. Before we start, uh, anybody, any experience with analytics in basketball? Yeah, we had uh, one experience at Nevins back here. Okay. So we have a, a piece presentation that we planned in four to five minutes, and it was three and a half hours. Okay. <laughs> yes. And that was the first uh, sign that we can start. Okay. And I think uh, we get a great, we had a great experience, and uh, that's when we start talk about very serious. Okay. He told that he has one expert. And yeah. <laughs> and that's the difference. Okay. So, <clears throat> Neman has a lot of experience from NBA. Uh, I think the last club he worked was in Memphis. I don't know. Any NBA fans here? Savage. <laughs> okay. He's, he's Which? Toronto Raptors. Okay. Okay. Yeah, I know. I know. So, okay. Nevan, Toronto. I have some examples from Toronto. You'll see. But Nevan worked for Memphis last time for Taylor Jenkins. And Taylor Jenkins, let's say, is an example of this new generation of coaches who are like very, not only great X and O guys, not only great communicators, great teachers, but he also has a very analytical mind. So if you listen to podcasts with him or interviews, you will see that they, loot, they, they use a lot of numbers in their jargon and they apply it a lot. In Memphis is, I think now, top five, top three organization in the NBA, finding the right players, finding the players on the fringes, like very good role players with a lot of the concepts that we will see. Okay, any, but you know basketball, box scores, statistics, things like that we know, yeah? Um, any expectation? For today, is there one thing that anybody would you like to learn? I would ask you after today if there was one thing that you wanted to see or learn. The real impact. What? Real impact on the team. Real. Talk about let's say result. Real impact. Okay, result, yeah. Let's say result. Okay. Okay. Any other expectation? Yeah, but how can we use how can we use uh, basketball analytics in, uh, in uh, our so, development program applic or player development program? Okay, <laughs> application. Plus, I write very poorly, so somebody will have to. Somebody else had. Analytics guarantees to coaching. Guarantees a win. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is different. The final score. Okay. I, I don't know, I will write it directly. So, what advanced analytics? But this question, I can sense you're a little bit skeptical. <laughs> okay, uh, any other expectation? The second is that the decision is to determine the specific position of any player for the future. For example, if somebody is playing one, two, or three, or four, or something specific from the deck. Okay. This. I put it just at edges because a lot of things is how this translates to the at edges. We will see a little bit some stuff and remind me when we go through some of the things, for example, player projections, things like this. Maybe this is some of the things. Uh, okay. Any other expectation or are we good? 
Okay, good. Then let's start. So we'll start with the first part, which is a little bit a story about how it all started. Uh, sorry. Oh, I have the... Yeah, so the title of the presentation is From Moneyball to Moriball. Anybody knows the movie, Moneyball? Yes? You know the guy, who? <laughs> Brad Pitt. I, it's a joke, but I have... I have a, a presentation on marketing conferences, you know, about, you know, what people can learn from basketball analytics in business. You know? And when I start on marketing conferences there, it's like different than here. It's mostly women and few guys. And my, this is my starter. Every time I start with Brad Pitt, people are happy, you know? <laughs> so, so, no, but Brad Pitt, yeah, he starred in this movie. He played a guy, knows, a guy named Billy Bean. You know the story of this? Yeah, I know. I can ask you something about the movie. Yes. Do you know which rock group what is up on the wall of Phil Samer's burning table? No. Okay. So this is, you see, I'm an analytics geek. I only looked at the numbers, but not the posters. So. Yes. Okay, nice observation. So, Billy Bean, who Brad Pitt played in the movie, he was a guy in late 90s in baseball. He worked for eight Oakland A's. And he basically started to adopt these analytical principles because Oakland A's, they were among the poorest teams in the baseball league. And they said, okay, if you want to beat the best, with a 10 times budget, so 10 times smaller budgets, we need to turn the odds on the casino. Yeah? So we need to find the right formula to beat the casino to, to win the title. But it wasn't actually Bini Bin who started with this. No, yeah, it was the guy called Bill James. Uh, the guy who's, who's called Bill James started with the concept that was called in baseball sabermetrics. This is this concept of advanced analytics and using it. And Billy, uh, Billy uh, Bean actually applied this concept later on. Uh, Billy Bean with Oakland A's never won the title. I think they were the second best team they come to that. But Bill James was actually hired by Boston Red Sox and won like four or five titles with them. And he worked for the Boston Red Sox, I think, until 2018 or 2019. But he started, you will see, in 2077, 88, he started doing these statistical almanacs, measuring things. And then he started with some formulas, trying to calculate how things can be done differently. And this is basically how sports analytics in the States, in the United States, started. It started first in baseball. And then, as you will see, the equivalent of Bill James in basketball, in NBA, is a guy called Dean Oliver. Anybody heard of him? No? So Dean Oliver wrote a book in late 99 or 2000 beginning, which is called Basketball on Paper, which was, let's say, the seminal book, the first book where he really started the concepts of advanced statistics, measuring the game, looking at it differently. He wrote it about in this book. Uh, Dean Oliver is currently the assistant coach of Washington Wizards. I think he's the only guy, uh, the only analytics guy who sits on the bench as an assistant. Other teams, as you will see, have a lot of big analytics departments, uh, but they are not like, they don't have assistant coach titles. So he, because of his seniority, because of he's been in the game for a long time, he is currently on the, on the bench of the Washington Wizards. So, as you can see here, this is a snapshot. Basketball on paper is new book. This is from the 1990s that combines the statistical analysis of Bill James in baseball with the coaching philosophy of Dean Smith. Dean Smith started, you know Dean Smith probably from Carolina, so he started a lot of the concepts, measuring possessions, things, points per possession, things like the efficiency that we now use in advanced analytics. He started it in the 80s, ways back. But Dean Oliver took it to another level and really put it together in a system systematically. And this book, Basketball is Paper, is like 
the, the Bible where the all analytics in basketball started. Um, one of the things that, uh, that Dean Oliver started are the four factors. Anybody heard of them in basketball, in statistics terms? Yeah, yeah. but anybody knows them, heard of them? Okay, so what he, what in this book, basketball on paper, there are a lot of things, but I think the most applicable that you will see, and if you maybe take away one thing and it will go to some of the applications and maybe can answer you, ask, uh, can help you answer this question, remember maybe the four factors and we will see how they look. Um, basically, four factors that he established are basically talking about four parts of the, the game. Shooting, you will see, he calculated effective field goal percentage. Protect the basketball, so this is the turnover rate. This is how good you shoot, how you protect, or how you make opposing team force turnovers rate. So in defense, how good are you at creating turnovers? How you rebound, again, on defense and offense, and do you go to the foul line? Now where we come to statistics and where the game and the advanced analytic clash, there, are, there is not an, an event on a basketball court that cannot be measured to one of these four factors. We will see later on, maybe you guys are skeptical, but we'll see how they measure this. And this structured approach to breaking down the game to these four factors, I think, at least for me, I'm a very systematic guy. You start top down, and especially if you want to measure the result, because at the end of the basketball game, you have a score, which is, I don't know, simple. You lost or you won by a few points. By why did you lose or why did you win? Four factors can help you understand that question. Um, you will see here, this is from Hawks, promotion brochure from 2013. So 10 years ago, they said this season, Hawk management and coaching start have begun looking beyond the score to determine the key factors to winning games. Famed basketball statistician Dean Oliver combined this into four factors, which analyzed the performance on a team in four areas, free throws, rebounding, turnovers, and of course, shooting. Okay, so try to remember these four factors and I'll show you and we can then talk and see through examples how do they really impact the game. But before we go to the four factors, quick quiz. Yes. And how many? Yes, so this is the, the, the challenge of the shooting. So if you go back, why, why we have effective field goal percentage, one of the four factors that Dean Oliver started was replacing field goal percentage with effective field goal percentage, right? So, and it's the answer to this question. In a lot of FIBA games, box scores, we don't see effective field goal percentage, right? We still, we see field goal percentage. And it's not only sh always showing the right answer. Because like you said, the guy who shoots 10 threes and made 49% is more efficient than the guy who shot 10 twos and made 56%, right? And this was, so one of the, these are the Dean Oliver four factors in math formulas. There won't be a quiz, you don't need to learn them, teach them. Yeah. We'll come to that. We'll see how we break down. This is just how you measure. A lot is hidden in shooting. A lot. Yeah? Like you said, how you defend, what kind of shots you're allowed, what, uh, how efficient are you at them, how you defend them. But at the end, shooting is measured by effective field goal percentage. And the key to the prior question, oops, is here, right? In this 0.5. This is how they measure. Because 
of what we needed. And you will see as a basketball, as coaches, as the whole basketball, let's say, through history, we, when was the three point shot introduced? 1984 in Europe? Yes, in NBA, I think, 79. So when? Giannis, 84 in FIBA game. But I think in NBA game it was in ABBA and then NBA 79 or 80, something like that, right? Doesn't matter. What we needed, so if I go, yeah, if I go back, so I told you this was 2013 Hawks, yeah? I would say that we as in basketball needed to, Maybe in NBA this started in 2005, let's say. But anyway, it doesn't matter. So from 84, 2005, it's at least 20 years, right? I would say it's more. But we as an industry needed 20 years to understand this in the effective field goal percentage, right? That the three-point shot is worth 50% more than the two-point shot. And this was, let's say, one impact is on the statistic, but we'll see how it affected the game. And this is the answer to the how we measure. OK, these are the formulas to other things. Don't need to memorize, need to understand. We will go differently. But the key point is anything that happens on the basketball floor can be measured by one of these four numbers. There is no event that cannot be measured by this number. So when we say effective field goal percentage and why I used why I used these two numbers 56 and 49 not because I like not round numbers but we had this situation in this year's NBA you see Steph Curry and Kevin Durant Kevin Durant shot 49% from the field Steph Curry 56% effective field goal percentage is the same yes so efficiency, scoring efficiency, they are the same. Because why? Kevin, Steph Curry takes 11 threes per game and Kevin Durant 4.9. But you can see, and if you go through the other top scorers, you can see in efficiency, effective field goal percentage, try to understand which one is really the efficient score. Yeah? Okay? M make sense? Okay, okay. So, why I'm saying, maybe not only four factors, but there are actually eight. Why? Because everything that you measure on offense, you measure for opponents, which is defense, yeah? So basically, if you go back, you have opponents and team advanced tech, yeah? So you have actually four factors become eight. And this is, as I said, that's why everything that, everything that happens can be measured by one of the eight factors, if we are exact, not only four, but eight. Okay, this is four factors, breakdown of the current last regular season in the NBA. Can you see the numbers, or is it too small? I put only top 16 teams. What you can see, let me see if this works. Not really, doesn't matter. So here is wins and losses. They are ranked by point differential. Point differential is typically how they measure success of the team in an NBA, not by wins and losses, but this is an average difference that you beat an opposing team. And this site also has it reduced for garbage time. So this is one thing. But now you can see this is the rank on offense. These numbers are rank. So best offense in the NBA was Sacramento, regular season, 119 points per 100 possession. And this is the rank on defense. So best NBA defense was Cleveland allowing 111, okay? And after that, you have four factors. Offense, defense, and rank. So for example, as I said, I covered Dallas. Dallas was sixth ranked on offense and 23rd ranked defense in the NBA. This was their problem because they're a terrible defensive team. But if you go into details how we can measure impact, where did the success on offense come? So they are fourth in the NBA in shooting in effective field goal percentage. 
and that's we need to understand where does this come from. Just we now know that they were one of the best shooting teams. It's combination of what kind of shots they take and how efficient are they at making them. They were second in the NBA in turnover rate, so they don't turn over. They don't give the ball, they protect the ball. They are a terrible offensive rebounding team. This is what also hurt them. Last in the NBA. Defense? We will see. We can try to try to figure out. As I said, these numbers are just what it is. To understand context, you need to dig deeper into sub-factors. We can, we will try tomorrow. And it's also understand context. Watch the film, understand the strategy. Is there strategy? Is it connected to transition defense? Yes. I don't know. Maybe it's so we they can also you will see as I will show you at the end. We have then Maybe. Maybe they did for 10 years and now we are talking, it's going back up. So yeah, we'll see. Yes, yes, we will see. I think now we are going in detail. One of my last analysis that I did for Dallas is why offensive rebounding is going back in trends. So in NBA for 10 years, it was declining yes. because they wanted to be kill the transition and be more efficient. But it was also connected to how they play defense because it was a lot of drop defense played. So it was hard when you have a seven foot tall guy, it's hard to crash the glass. But us with Golden State, with Houston, it's spaced out. They started to switch. So now the big guy is switched. I don't know, anybody watched playing game, Miami, Atlanta? What happened? Miami is the team that switches the most in the NBA. They switch every time, bam, on a shooter. Clint Capella killed them on the offensive glass. So that is a counter to the trend that offensive rebounding is declining. Is again, switching, punish it. On the, one of the things is punish them on the glass. And for Dallas, the problem was they were so small. Even when they were switched, the little guy would get switched and they would be there were the worst in the league in the second chances. Yeah? Okay. Yeah, we will go. But so on defense, you can see they're like just a bad defense because everything in every area they're ranked in bottom third. So 20, 30 teams in the NBA. 21, 22, okay, 18, 27. Yeah? So to me, you can already see. So they didn't force a lot of turnovers, not a very aggressive team, but they foul a lot, fourth most in the NBA. So this means you're breaking down, probably. But if you look at the lead defenses, you can already see some style, yeah? So Milwaukee, I was talking. A lot of talk was switching drop defenses. Is that Milwaukee was? And this changed in the last week because of the tanking. I think Milwaukee for most of the season was the best team, defensive team. What did they do? They have Brook Lopez, a big guy, drop, and very aggressive on-ball defender in Drew Holiday. So you can see, best opponent, so they allow the tougher shots, no shot at the rim, mostly forced mid-range, but they are not aggressive because they're dropping back, so they're not like on ball showing two, trapping, stuff like that. So the worst in the NBA enforcing turnovers, but they don't foul and they don't allow offensive rebounding. So you can see it. here is a clear identity on defense of a team. Yeah? You can see from the four factors. So these are some of the things we will see how you break them down. But this is like a dashboard where you are, where is your opposition. So when you play a team, you can a little bit already see the style of the opponent through the four factors. Make sense? Okay. So this is how we try to break down. Then we will see for different things how, but for me, it all starts from here. Okay. Let me go back. Sorry. These slides. So 1992, I grabbed this It's a bad picture, but I got it on a date screenshot. What do you see here? Yeah. All five players inside the three-point line, right? And this is what we will see. And this was impact of this math logic of valuing the 50% more valuable shot is what happened with spacing in the NBA especially. In Europe, it's a little bit different because the floor is different. It's smaller, the three-point line, corner free, a lot of things. 
So, but we'll see the similar things. So 20 years, uh, not 20, this is 40 years ago. Yeah? Everybody was, yeah, everybody, this is uh, yeah, Rick Smith, uh, yeah, Reggie Miller, you have the Davis brothers, Davis and Antonio Davis, the big one. But the absurd thing that happens, yeah, I think what happened that 20 years ago, only the best shooters were allowed to take the three-point shot. Yeah? Because like Curry's father, Dale Curry, Drajan Petrovic, he was Steve Kerr, guys like that. Everybody had a shooter, like good shooter, but he was the one taking threes. Everybody else shot twos, like they were inside. And now it's the opposite in the NBA, at least. So everybody must shoot threes, but only the best mid-range shooters like Kevin Durant, Devin Booker, Luka Doncic in our case, short mid-range. Uh, Darren Fox now in the NBA playoffs, if you watch Sacramento, he's a, his leap this year is because he became such an efficient mid-range shooter. So this is the, let's say, the, the change in philosophy that happened. I don't know how it translates to yacht ages, but I think it's also it is how we train for certain skills or for certain skill sets, yeah? Um, and this is, this is the top 200 shot locations in the NBA. This is how it changed, yeah? Basically, because of this impact of 50% more valuable three-point shot. So all these locations, I mean, not completely that, but a lot of less of these shots. Okay. Why? This is now effective field goal percentage efficiency. Or so from early 2000s, where you saw this picture, where everybody was inside, to now. What do you see from this chart? So the red one is two point shot. Yeah, so what happened basically? The efficiency of the three point shot. It's more or less the same. It goes a little bit, but the effective field goal percentage is around 55 to 54% range. But what we have on that efficiency of the two point shot is almost at the level of the three point shot. So, because we take layups, ring shots, or layups, or very efficient scorers take twos. So, this is the change when we try to fine tune the offenses to be more and more efficient. The main reason is basically behind, and like it or not, it's a little bit mad behind that 50% value. Mm. So where we come back from Moneyball to Moriball, Daryl Mori, he was like Billy Bean of the NBA in a way. I don't know, he started his career in Boston, 2000, then in early 2010s he went to Houston. Now he is the GM of the Philadelphia 70, uh, 76ers. Uh, he went at something, eh? and this is what we said, this philosophy on analytics favoring three-point sport and field goals, layups, or mid-range mid shots. So he developed something which was called a Mori Ball Index, which is basically a share of three-point shots and shots in the paint. I try to, so this is my visualization, my calculation for this year's NBA to calculate this Mori Ball Index and see does it correlate with the offense efficiency. So on this, on this, from left to right, or sorry, yeah, from, yeah, from your side, left to right, so this is the worst of offense in the NBA, Charlotte, 109 points per 100, and the best one, which was Sacramento, 119 we saw. So this, the, you go from here are the more efficient offenses. And the high is the Mori Ball Index. So basically, top you will see Portland, Boston, and Dallas. For them, 75, 74% of their shots were either freeze or paint. And this season, you can see the correlation between efficiency of the offenses and the index, right? Most of the teams here were very efficient offenses. And most of the teams below were not as efficient. You have some exemptions. For example, I don't know, Houston or Portland, Indiana. But the most efficient offenses were also the best at what we call this Mori Ball Index, right? Atlanta, 
quite efficient opens, but you can see with uh, Dejante Mori, Trey Young, they take a lot of mid-range shots. Yes. So this is something. And in 2010 or late 2008, 7, 9, 10, what they saw in NBA, this was like the biggest inefficiency. The, the, I don't know if you remember the finals. Stan Van Gandhi started with him, with Orlando Magic. So what he did, he surrounded Dwight Howard with four shooters. So his power forward was either Hedo Turkoglu or Rashad Lewis. So basically a stretch four, which is now. And this inefficiency, so this Mori Ball Index, from 2010 to 2017, there was a clear connection between the best offensive teams and the Finns who really applied this. So these were these early adopters. And the best teams, Houston, the peak was Morris, James Harden, Houston. Yeah? So they came to the finals. Now they say the, that style was not successful, but they almost beat the best team ever, probably assembled with Kevin Durant, Steph Curry. They were one injury away to winning the NBA Finals. Yeah? But, so this was late 2019, where the rest of the NBA was, was already catching up. But I think this... Yeah, yeah. So that's why I'm saying late 19, 18, 19, 20, that's when mainstream everybody was already catching up. What I'm trying to say here, that from 2008, 9, 10, Till 15, 16, there was a gap of six, seven years where the smartest teeth in the NBA had a huge advantage. So this was Dallas, Boston, Houston, uh, Golden State, which applied these practices. They were like two steps above in offense efficiency. And what I see now talking to European coaches, different people, I think we, because nobody is applying, I'm not saying copying this, but just more scientific approach to basketball, I think there is this opportunity of early adopters being more efficient at sm doing smarter. Now in the NBA, so this, this chart is from 2019-20, when the NBA caught up. Yeah? So these are the analytic departments. So you see, I don't know, Dallas had like eight people. Uh, OKC. Another Maury clone, Sam Presti. I don't know if you know him. Yeah, again, one of the smartest teams currently in the NBA, if you ask me. Biggest step. So now, analytics, you cannot, not you cannot. It's much harder to find competitive advantage through analytics than it was in 2010, because everybody is doing it. Everybody. So now you have to do a lot of more advanced things. Really, it's like winning on the margins. While in 2010, it was like, just do this, <laughs> your offense will be, if you get this, apply these principles, it's much, your offense will be 30% more efficient than the rest of the league. Uh, and this is the trend. Like I said, now NBA teams have uh, analytics department, they have developers, they have a bunch of smart people working uh, in their back offices. I know people or work with people in the, uh, for the Mavericks analytics department. So a lot of really advanced things that they're doing there and tracking. OK? OK, now before we uh, continue, just let me take one sip. <clears throat> so this was the intro of how we got here where we are. I'm now talking NBA basketball, not Europe. We will talk about Europe later. Any questions here or clear? You knew this about this? No? Yes? No? Okay. Okay. So, but basically, like I said, a lot of these things are happening in NBA. And, but now I'm not talking only NBA because this is happening in, across all uh, American sports. Football, baseball was the first, hockey, NFL everything. What I see as general trend, because most, of, not most, all American clubs, they call it franchises, are privately owned. And a lot of in the, what happened in the last 15 years, a lot of the owned, old owners, I don't know, guys like Jerry, uh, Jerry Bass, who owned the Lakers, Donald Sterling, who learned the Clippers. So these, let's say, old school guys 
who made money in different industries, but a lot if it was oil industry, things like that, were replaced by the guys, new billionaires who came from tech. And my theory, this is not, is that in general, MBA became much smarter in terms of this corporate management, this data-driven management that came from tech is now applied to, to clubs. Um, what I see and how it relates to Europe because a lot of these owners that owned MBA clubs, not a lot, some, for example, the Kronke group that owns Denver Nuggets, they own Arsenal. So this is coming with that, with that capital, it's coming to European football. The top clubs in Europe, they don't have, in my opinion, these big department sets, but you will you can already see that they have analytics department, data science department, stuff like that. Again, because there is a lot of capital, a lot of money. Basketball in Europe, there is not as clear ownership structure and not as much capital, so we are still a little bit behind. But the trend that I see, it will come from football, European football, to other franchises, to other clubs, to other industries. Um, okay, so this was historical how, let's say, analytics evolved and how they impacted the sport. This, one, this is how, where we get the data from, how we track stuff. So I didn't put, I put first step from box score to play-by-play -play data. The first thing that we have in basketball, I think practically since ever, it was the box score. Right? So we have the box score we are measuring. And this was, let's say, the main statistics for a long time. Every time I would, I don't know, in the 90s, we don't have internet, so box score, checking the box score, how many points, how many rebounds, things like that. But I think the first thing, and if we go back to four factors, if you want to measure the four factors, box score data is not enough because you don't get the information needed. You don't get possession data and stuff like that from the box score. So that's why you need play-by-play -play data, right? So the first, let's say what, Dean Oliver did, he was making play-by-play -play data and Dean Smith, and I can show some of you, if you're really interested in history, how they did it manually. So he was writing per possession, possession notes, coded it by himself in late 80s, tracking possession. Now we have play-by-play -play data. This is an example from NBA.com. So in NBA, this is very structured. You have like three or four people who are tracking possession, play-by-play. And then in the play-by-play -play data, you see what happened, at which minute, which person. You see the substitutions, you see rebounds, you see the short distance, things like that. So play-by-play -play data is the first thing that we need to have if we want to calculate the four factors. Um, so if you want that, we need play-by-play -play data. In Europe, we have it also. In most of the leagues, I, have, I will show you tomorrow examples. So we parse the play-by-play -play data from different leagues and we can calculate the four factors for most of European leagues. I'm not sure if, the, if it's so exact as the NBA play-by-play -play data because there it's a, a lot of analytics depend on it. So they are, as I said, they have one or two people in each arena on game putting it in and they have the third person who is like checking if everything was okay. I don't know, this year there was a lot of controversy because they said the defensive player of the year, Jaron Jackson Jr., had a lot of more blocks at home than away. So they will say this, there is a bias, which is the biggest problem in data, in coaching, is our bias, is what we want to see. So they were like, the theory was that the home play-by-play -play team was tracking more blocks than needed because sometimes no, we can know the typical block, but sometimes in NBA, they, when you just swipe on the ball, they mark it as a block. So these were the things. There was also Warriors Arena for years. They tried to see why Warriors allow so little shots at the rim. And they saw that the, their play-by-play -play team, shot location for short mid-range, then the rim was not same as the rest of the league. So why am I telling you this? Because Somebody of you, I don't know, maybe someday you say, oh, this is great. We want to have four factors. I want to measure. You always need to 
be skeptical of data. You need to challenge the data. Sometimes the number that you will see, it's not because your team is good or bad, because the data is wrong. This is the primer law of analytic statistics. If you see something that's jumping out, it's probably not because it's so good or so bad, it's probably because the data is wrong. So that's why play-by-play -play is great. Um, as I said, I'm starting later because I mostly work with MBA data, but later we did like two, three projects. Uh, we parsed the data for uh, European play-by-play. -play. I'm not, this is something that I need to check in the following months to see this process of the play-by-play -play quality, especially if you go from FIBA competition to EuroLeague to EuroCup, you know what a mess our basketball is, league rules competition-wise. So it's not like one NBA rules for play-by-play. -play. Each probably, I assume, has <laughs> their own. So this is, I would assume, could be a problem. But again, going back, once we go from box score to play-by-play, -play, a lot of new opportunities for analysis of the basketball game opens. Yeah? So what we can ca calculate from play-by-play, -play, four factors, offense, defense, that you saw, this is, can be you don't need anything, you just need play-by-play -play data. You don't need any tracking, anything. Players' impact on four factors. So the beauty of the four factors, and I will show you, is not only measures your team, but this it tries helps you answer the question that you might have as a coach. How is this player impacting, I don't know, our turnover rate, our offensive rebounding rate? Not only player, lineups analysis, yeah? How do we play? Does our challenge, style of play change? If I don't know, we play with two bigs or with one big? How do we rebound? How do, are we more efficient on offense and defense? So all this stuff comes from the play-by-play -play data. So you can answer a lot of questions already. And then, because play-by-play, -play, what is the problem of the box score? Box score is a snapshot at the end. This many shots. So it's just end scan. While play-by-play -play can give you the story of the game from minute zero to minute 40 or 48 in NBA. So you can see how we progress throughout the game. You can see, you can calculate pace. You can see which locations do we take shots. How are we efficient? Uh, you can see, I don't know, in which, how efficient were we when we took shots in first, sec first five seconds of the shot clock? 5 to 10, 10 till 15, 15 till 34. So all these things can be done by play-by-play -play data. A lot of things, a lot of things that you can measure to really understand, again, real impact on what brings you impact on winning and what not. And then some strategy, in-game strategy can be done, calculated based on this play-by-play -play data. Is it better to take at the end of the game two or a three, depending on a score? what to do at the end of the quarter. So this is one thing that analytics in NBA has a lot of impact. They break down, started, you will see on every game, probably now even in Europe, these two for one situations, they go, I don't know. Yeah, but now in NBA they would calculate, I don't know, if it's timeout at one ten left, what do we do? It's a free throw, and how we do we calculate the last minute possession? I don't know, I was watching, Janis, you were probably too, Slovenia on Eurobasket this year, well, some games are terrible at the end of clock. You know, we had 24 seconds left or 30 seconds left. And I don't know, Dragic is pushing and turns over the ball. So it's like double impact. Or we take a free with 10 seconds left in the third quarter. So if you multiply end of quarters, first free, how you manage these inefficiencies could give you three, four, five points. And three, four, five points. It's a lot in a basketball game. I mean, this can be you lose or you win. Yeah? So that's a lot of things. And why I'm telling you this play-by-play? -play? Because this is something that we already have in Europe. We don't need anything else. Maybe we need to parse it. We need to calculate it. But this is done, I think, now in all competitions, at least the major ones. I don't know for Hungary, for, uh, let's say, for men's, for women's leagues. But I see it for most leagues, even lower level. I don't know in Slovenian if we have it, but I saw it. I know we do it for ABBA League. You can get the play-by-play -play data. Okay. It's the same problem. Yeah. So how, how accurate it is, we don't know. Yeah. 
That's but that's the global in same problem we talk about uh, that's happened to Golden State or you know they complain about Mandal Ray T that they fix it in that. Yeah. Okay, so that's why but if you track it, you will see it sooner or later. That's one thing. Also, okay, you can be skeptical. There are things that they can track properly or subjectively, short distance, whatever, blocks. But there are things that you cannot do subjectively. Substitutions. What we see in play-by-play, -play, they sometimes forget to tell, and then you need to check and you need to correct it. But from the substitutions, these are things that are measured, and once you have substitution, you get the lineup analysis. So it's, some things can be impacted, some more difficult. To. So it's not, okay, this is all crap, forget it. Okay, maybe some parts is not good, but we know which part, and we'll try to either correct it or we try to take it with a little bit of skepticism. Okay, so for example, one of the things that I showed you, player impact on four factors. I will show you the demon, but this is, for example, I don't know, you know Steven Adams? So for years, especially in Oklahoma City days, when Russell was, Westbrook were collecting triple doubles, it was, you know, who is a better rebounder? Who is the best rebounder? So he was like averaging 10, 11 rebounds a game, and Steven Adams was averaging 7, 8. But when you looked at his... So now this is the same four factors that you saw before through his career, offense, defense, but this is his impact. Yeah? And here you see percentile. So what this means, 100 percentiles means basically the best in the NBA. So offensive rebounding impact, Steven Adams, plus 11. Yes. No, when he's on the court. For a team. So this means this last line, this season, Average offense rebound percentage in the NBA was, I think, between 20, 26, 27. So, which means on average, NBA teams would rebound 27% of their misses. When Steven Adams was on the floor, Memphis, which was, let me go back. Oops, sorry. And did we miss this? I was too, okay. So Memphis, fifth best teams offensive rebounding team in the NBA. So they were at 20, uh, where did I lose it? So they were 21.1%. Per, and the league average was 26 by 8. So Memphis was one of the best offensive rebounding team in the NBA. Now, when Steven Adams was on the court, this percentage increased by 11%. So it was, instead of 28, it was 49. Imagine. You are, the team rebounded every, almost every half, every other shot, 40% of the shots. And I don't know, if you watch playoffs now, the problem that Memphis has is became terrible offensive rebounding team because he's injured. So they play smaller, and they don't put pressure. But throughout his career, you can see last one, two, three, four, five, six, there was 86, but five of the last six years, he was in 95 percentile of the NBA in offensive rebounding. This means top one, two, three, or five. Yeah? So you can see his impact, and then you can see impact on defense. Yeah? So when he's on the floor, they don't foul, because again, they play, play more conservatively. But this is, for example, an example of an impact, how a player has an impact on the four factors, yeah? So is a certain player impacting which part of the game he is impacting? And we can break it down later on in more detail if you're interested, but this is just one of the examples of, again, what can be done only from play-by-play. -play. Make sense? Okay. The next frontier, that came in the NBA after the play-by-play -play was the tracking data. Tracking data came in the league, as I was telling you before the story, around 2009-10, smart teams started to do the analytics. So I think 2012, or I have the, the first season that I have tracking data is 2013, 
when the tracking data became available. What do we mean by tracking data? I will show you today and tomorrow two platforms. One is Synergy, probably heard about it, or somebody of you heard Synergy, yeah? Okay, the second one is Second Spectrum. Second Spectrum is the tracking data provider since 2013 till now. I think this off-season NBA might change the provider, which will be a big thing, but for last, I, I, I need to find it, I, I can give you. But before 2013, there was like three years of somebody else. So they, I think the first tracking data started 2010, something like that. Doesn't matter. How does it work? Synergy is mostly manual. Ex-basketball players, people like you, if you want. You did it? Logging? Okay, so you can, so you can explain. You log the game and you try to do. I don't know because now a lot of new stuff and this we can di discuss later on um, because how some of the stuff, for example, is shot is contested, not contested, the distance, I think distance probably comes from the play-by-play -play by contesting. I don't know if you guys are doing or is... Uh, we talk, but I know the big problem was with uh, they check, you know, it's like uh, they changing yeah, yeah. the shot. Mm -hmm. And we did before for universities, we did the uh, we did by, by ourselves. Mm -hmm. And the NBA they fall in from the yeah. So what I'm trying to tell synergy, a lot of good stuff. We will see how we can use it, how we can use it to evaluate, but we need to keep in mind it's still manual. And as, as long as it's manual, there is a much larger error uh, possibility of a mistake. Um, exactly. Second spectrum, on the other hand, how it works. So they have a 20, I don't know how many, 20, 30 cameras in each NBA arena on top, and they record every, every second, 25, 30 frames per second. So they record, and then with the AI and artificial intelligence, they identify the players, the distance, shot distance, shot location, all this stuff. So this is done via technology. So tracking in NBA is done by technology. They also do the same in hockey, in football, a lot of things. But this is what I would say the, the real tracking, yeah? Because it's automated. Um, what can tracking data give us on top of the play-by-play? -play? One thing that they do now, so what is measure? I don't know, imagine this guy takes a shot. So it measures the distance, closest defender, how, how far it is. It measures the distance to the shot. So you can have distance closest defender. And these are the two most important things. Much more it goes when in the shot clock, what was the action. There is a lot of, but when they calculate shot quality. I don't know if you heard about the concept of shot quality, but it's one thing that's now really used and you have it also in Synergy now, but for NBA, Shot quality is basically a metric that gives you how good is your offense or how bad. So it has direct correlation to effective field goal percentage. So shot quality will tell you, did you take a good or did your offense generate a good shot or a bad shot? And on the other way, for the defense, are you forcing tough shots or are you forcing easy shots? And it takes into the consideration, like I said, closest defender, distance, shot clock, a lot of stuff. But imagine evaluating if a player is a good shooter or not. If you have just, even if you have effective field goal percentage, we don't know who is a better shooter. Uh, I can give you an example, I don't know. My, Dallas Mavericks, you watch? Anyway, so who is a better shooter, Luka Doncic or Dorian Finney-Smith? We don't know. One has 40%, three-point percentage, the one has 35. But short quality for one is 10 times harder than for the other. Yeah? So how good is a shooter on uncontested shots, on open looks? How good is a person creating his own shots? What they also measure is dribbles, touch time. So we can see from this, we can calculate or we can see who is good at spot-up situations, who is good at creating his shot. Typically what we use, and I will show you again later, for example, for self-created shots, we take all shots that 
based on the tracking data, had at least two seconds of touch time or at least one dribble. Or others are assisted shots. Yeah? Because if I get it in a... Uh, if I take just no dribble, one second touch time, it's shoot. Yeah? It's under the rim. Maybe transition is a little bit different because I, I can throw it ahead to somebody and he dribbles like three times and two seconds. But in general, it's quite a good rule. Again, based on the tracking data. We can see who is good at creating his own shot, who is good at assisted shots. So these are different roles, different players. Yeah? If you would use just uh, basic statistics, you cannot know this. You can only watch by eyes and see, okay, this one is a good shooter, but we are very biased as people. So if somebody has a nice stroke, we think he's a good shooter, but maybe he's not. Yeah? So a lot of this comes from tracking. What NBA does as well from this trapping, they already identify plays. So they identify how many picks, how many screens happened. They identify the tracking data, identify what was the defense on the screen. Was it soft drop? Was it hatch, switch, show, trap, blitz? We know this. And we also know how good are you at defending this as a team. They identify isolations, off-ball screens, handoffs, all this stuff that can help you understand, going back to your question of effective field goal, so you have a lot of additional information in terms of shot quality, in terms of what offense, shot location. Now you can build your picture why our effective field goal percentage is good or bad, because this provides you context. Rebounding, we were discussing before. One of the big things is, again, who is a good rebounder or not. Without Steven Adams. What they do with tracking, they break down rebounding in three areas. First one is positioning. So imagine this guy misses a shot. So this is white, this is black, black. Yeah? So what was positioning at the miss? So this guy has a, probably a good position. If it's not a long rebound, this one not so much. So the guy, the rebounders that are good, Establishing position will rank good at positioning, yeah? But then for this guy, okay, once the ball misses, it's a crash rate, yeah? How good is he coming from here to here? How many spaces does he, does he cover? So this is another aspect of rebounding. So, for example, Dennis Rodman, he was great at crash rate, yeah? Maybe not so good at positioning. Steven Adams, Rudy Gobert, they are the positioning guys. They will block out, yeah? And then at the end, is convert. So once you, from position... When you get to there, how good are you getting contested rebounds? So with this data, we can be much better if a person is good rebounder or not. Yeah? I was talking with one European coach recently, and we were talking about, I don't know, which of my big guys is a better rebounder exactly. So you go back. So some of these parts can help you. A little bit. Although on small sample sizes, this can also be skewed, cannot be necessarily 100% accurate. Of course, if you have a guy like this with these clear stats, you know he's great, but you probably know also watching him. But if you don't have to, uh, with tracking data in the NBA, like I said, what they do, you can answer these questions much better and you can see which guys are really good at at uh, rebounding and in which areas of rebounding because as I said some of the best rebounders are different a different uh, a different position going back to the question about offensive rebounding trends you can see by scouting the team which team is really crashing and from which side is it crashing from the wings how much they crash for example a team like Toronto they were one of the best offensive rebounding team because most of the wings are really long athletic and they would crash the rebounds. Yeah? So you can see when you do the scouting, you can see this stuff. So these are some of the things, like I said, I can show you later on in a demo, but now if I want to see, I don't know, for Luka Doncic, for last 10 games, how many pick and rolls, how, what was the defense, how, how well did he did it against different defense types, who are his best pick and roll partners? All this comes from the tracking data. We can see this stuff. Yeah.
It is, yeah. I, I got access to, I was doing one other clinic, I got access to Instat, I didn't watch a lot. I'm not sure how good their quality assurance process behind this, because it's manual, you know. For, I'm, my feeling, maybe it's not true, I, is that Synergy is maybe a little bit more process behind this, this quality assurance is a little, yeah, yeah. exactly. But similar things, but it would, uh, Instat would come into this manual category. Okay, I don't know when or will Europe, FIBA ever be rich enough or clubs interested enough to get tracking into our arenas? I think eventually we will. I'm just telling you to know once it comes, you will be aware what is the difference in terms of information that you get from play-by-play -play and what is that you can get from tracking data. Okay, any questions here? And we will look all this stuff, I will try to show you later on, so you'll see how it looks in practice. Any questions here? Okay. Um, one of the things, one of the things that I said, uh, that I mentioned here at the land are these so-called advanced metrics. What are, what are advanced metrics? Advanced metrics, again, I think they try to answer this question because what do we really want to know as a coach is which player is really impacting the winning, yeah? Which players or which part of the game? Because we know, I know you much better, probably, not probably, for sure than me, that some players are good at picking up individual stats, but individual stats do not only always translate to a win, yeah? So the real question that all these data science departments, all this stuff are trying to answer is who is impacting winning at which part and stuff like that. So that's why they developed in advanced impact metric. Um, I won't go into details how these are calculated because there are a lot of science, data science, statistical science behind. But the key idea is even on off data, because what is the problem now that I see? Plus minuses became available, right? And some coaches I would see even in Europe, oh, this guy had like plus 10 in this game. In these small samples, lineup data, plus minus data is very skewed, which means that imagine you're playing with Steph Curry, he hits free threes, your plus will be plus 15. Is it really happen because you're on the floor with him? Who is on the other part? Plus minus will not will not adjust for this. In a large sample sizes, I don't know, Euro in a EuroLeague when you have uh, NBA 82 games, you have a player who played, I don't know, an average 3,000 possessions. Like you saw with Steven Adams, some things will come up. Also, but even there, you know, sometimes some season his defensive stats will be better the next season, even in an 82 games. I don't know, it's just luck. He was three-point shot, the opposing team shot 45% on that night. You know, that's why these advanced metrics, they use a lot of this regulation, a lot of algorithm stuff to skew this, to adjust for this volatility, yeah? So, as I said, I won't go into detail. If somebody wants to know, I can explain more. But the main idea is these methods try to regularize and try to cut these peaks, you know? Try to adjust for luck. Never will be completely correct, but, Sometimes it's better. This is an example. So we have a lot of different uh, metrics. I can show you some. This is, for example, from uh, uh, estimated plus minus. So you see the best, uh, the best players this year. Nikola Jokic, like you said, he has an estimated plus minus. So this is adjusted plus minus, not the ones pure from play by play. It was uh, 0.7.9, and it was mostly on off. So on defense, Denver was more or less the same with him or without, but much better. So these are some of these advanced metrics. We can then break them down again onto four factors, but these advanced metrics are trying to answer this question, who is having a real impact on the win, yeah? Um, okay. The arc, these are all like abbreviation. We'll check, I will show you. It's, yeah, 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 it was like a joke, but it's, 
uh, but it's no, 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 no. It's a, it's a stat. These are all stats. It's just abbreviation, and because why, why the, because the we, now we will show you. It's just abbreviation, and because these names, uh, I would assume, adjusting regularize something. But we will check and I will tell you. Okay, it, it's just when these people who are inventing them, they try to put abbreviations together so that people can remember. It. That's the whole trick. Yeah, okay. But it's one of the best ones currently. We can show you. I will show you. But what basically this, they are just metrics. So there will be a number, but some teams are using them to evaluate players' impact. Okay? So, for example, what advanced. Analytics can be used. It's also for player projections. This is used now with data science. It won't go back to yet ages or a little bit different. We can talk about this, but for example, this is a true story. So I don't know the people who watched Dallas, if you remember playoffs two seasons ago when they lost to the Clippers, when Rick Carlisle was still the, the coach. Jalen Brunson averaged at the end of the series like 10 minutes per game. He was played off the floor, didn't play. And also he was a backup then. So what we did, this is one, let's say, one of the projections that I missed many, but one that I was, let's say, proud of myself when we worked. So this was in 2011 when Jason Kidd took over. He was still uh, a bench player. He wasn't starting yet. We were trying to use some of, I use some of my models, but this is, for example, the Arco projection. We tried to use these models to see what's his peak, because at that point he was a backup player. But a lot of stuff that we saw before, if you would just take his per game averages, like 11 points, I don't know, 25 minutes per game. But a lot of advanced metrics, what I was telling you before, how good it was he is creating his own shot, how good, how efficient was he? Uh, was he a self-created shots? Was already there. So this is when we said we did a projection, and we say, okay, how would you feel if Mavericks already had Fred Van Fleet, Mark Con Conley? And this is, for example, what you can do with Darko. It's available. You can compare people through this metric through their career, and you can see this blue line is Jalen Brunson. And even then, you could see he was on similar. Career path as Mike Conley, Kyle Lowry, Fred Van Fleet. We also we, we tried to do a comparison to smaller guards who came a little bit later in the league. So these were all guys who were like, yeah, not high drafted, but also they were like a little bit older, like 23, 24. So with most of these metrics, he was he was basically, and when we published that article, I remember. Ah, Fred Van Fleet, he's like, because Toronto, one year before they won the championship, people were like making fun. He's not, Kyle Lowry is like an all-star. You know, he will be a career backup. What I'm telling you, even this will not be right. But you can see some patterns, you can see some stuff. And for him, even at that time, if you look at some of these more advanced things, you could see that he was comparing very favorably to some of these guys. Yeah? So this is, again, application. And this in the NBA is huge, because draft has such a big impact to, to draft the, the, the proper player. But also, when you sign a player, how much money can you assign? Is the guy projecting to be a starter, an all-star, or is a bench player? Because they have salary cap, they need to project this stuff to know how much money you can give. So this is one application of advanced metrics to do player, let's say, player projections. What we also do, we can do player similarities. You say, for example, this is why I was doing this for some European projects. So you say, OK, I like this point guard. And these are the things that we want to measure, for example. Efficiency of self-created shots, efficiency in pick and roll. What we can say is take a pool of 500 players, which are the 20 players that are compare, most comparable, he's most similar to. So imagine in Europe, you can take the, I don't know, G League data and try to find the next, I don't know, Kevin Panther or the next Shabazz Napier. Yeah? So these are, again, 
this is what advanced statistics or advanced uh, analytics can do. You can build similar player profiles based on different attributes, roles, and stats. And the more stats that you have, like tracking, the better the projection can be, right? I didn't, I didn't play it for like the last 20 years, but I get your point. Yes, yes. Yes. Okay, so this is one application. The future, where are we going? No, it's not the end. <laughs> yes. So what I see in MBA, team started to track practice. So, because especially, and this I think is very relevant for Europe, because as I said, MBA season is long, have 82 games, a lot of minutes, and a lot of this noise with larger samples, more. If somebody, I don't know, is 40% shooter on a 50 shots, is he a good shooter? He, he misses two more and he's like 35, he's, he's bad, not. But if you have 500 shots in his career and he's 40%, he's probably a good shooter. It's the same with pick and rolls and things. The problem in Europe is we have a, I don't know, EuroLeague has like, in NBA they say after 20 games, you start to see the trend, but in EuroLeague this is already half of a season or in your national leagues, I don't know. So adding practice data, if the guys, they, do, they started to do, to do that. Tracking, now I told you they can understand, I don't know, pick and roll, coverage type, dribble handoff, stuff like that. I think in the future we will try to understand more complex plays. Breaking down defense, defense is always, we are always one step behind with defense and measuring defense because it's really difficult, much difficult than because for offense we have more stats, but I think we are getting there. Next thing is biometrics. I don't know if we will get there in the NBA, but they started in women, women NBA. So they would put, they had these belts. So you would really see how high the person jumped, how fast did he run, explosion, stuff like that. But this will be tricky because it's a lot of player personal data. So we will see how they will negotiate. Will this be shared? But it's already there, just not public used. And next is the, just one thing, Toronto Raptor fan. This is for their practice facility. It's a board. You can see what they measure. They measure the arc on a shot, on a practice shot. So they have like a board and they can see. It's a little bit futuristic to me, but it's in their practice facility. If you will Google, you'll find it. So they try to, adjust shooters by measuring with this biometric stuff, how people are shooting, correcting the shooting, the arc, the positioning and things like that. So this goes into these two areas. Now, the next thing is, I don't know, AI, chat GPT. I don't know how many of you heard it about chat GPT, yes? It's, it's where things get creepy, right? So before this game, I was doing a, uh, a television game on uh, on uh, Sunday for our Slovenian television. We were uh, we were doing Sacramento Golden State, and uh, a lot of time teams play box and one defense against Steph Curry. So we were talking with one of Slovenian coaches, Janus Nois and Luka Basin. He was showing me some clips of that after the game about box and one how they play and stuff like that he has also clinics how to do it against box and one how to set it up and then so after that i tried to ask chat gpt what is the best counter against box and one defense it's still a little bit generic <laughs> but you must know that this is the beginning so what did he say box and one defense is a defensive strategy used in basketball to shut down a specific player while the rest of the team plays a zone defense it can be an effective strategy against a dominant scorer, but there is always ways to counter it. Here are the few. And then it's moments, through streams, ball movements, shooting, patience, whatever. But as I said, it's still generic. I don't think a good coach would take anything. But I think it's what I wanted to show is it's getting really creepy because he, you get this answer like now. So even in NBA, teams have like people with iPads at the big head. But imagine you are a coach and you're facing a box and one, you get an assistant who tells you <laughs> how to counter. Yeah? So that's one application. But this is just uh, at the end trying to tell you where I think we are going with some of these stuffs because I think it's there. Yeah? So uh, people, 
I don't know if you know StatMuse. There is a platform. You can ask for stat, and it will find on their own. You don't need to do filter searches. So this is a little bit similar. But this, I think, eventually, we will get, uh, we will get close to that. Yes, yes, yes. That was the my coaching friend. <laughs> his exact same reaction. That's how it starts. Yes, uh, but hate it or love it, I think we need to be aware, and probably there will be some practical applications. Okay, for the end, this is a. There is always debate in basketball, in NBA, between analytics and coaches. What some people are very, it's like all things in current society, it's binary, one or zero. Either you're an analytic person or you're a real coach, a real basketball player. You always need to merge this. This is a guy who wrote one very good book now lately about analytics. He, uh, he used to be head of the analytics of the Milwaukee Bucks when they won the championship. And he said, I will never, because he works in the Olympic department, I will never see the game the way the coach sees. Yeah? That's coach's job. Yeah? He knows X and knows. You can learn about it. You can learn about context. But this is what they're about. But on the other hand, but the data, what analytics can see, you can see every game. Yeah? Thousands of games. And coach or scout or a person can never see all the games at once. And to me, there is a merge between these two. And before we go into the demo, I will end this. The, the first part of the presentation is wherever, and this is not basketball, this is not analytics, you know, because as I said, we have these discussions, you know, either you are a nerd, analytic nerd, or you are a real hooper, you know, a real basketball player. And this is, this is one of my post posts, the nerds, and this is not uh, Kevin Durant's reply to my post, but to one other analytic guy. And, you know, and he said, who the fuck look at the grabs while having a hoop conversation, you know? So we are always having, when you're talking to players, ah, coaches, forget about this. Um, and there is this huge division. Why? Because there are a lot of fears, that there are a lot of uncertainties. And when people are certain, I don't know, coaches now think, will I need to know math now? Will I need to become a statistician? Will I need to become a geek? I'm not comfortable with this. I'm good at sports. Same with players. And it's not only sports, it's in all aspects. In business, when it comes back, you need empathy. People who work in analytics or people who are using analytics need empathy to understand the person on the other side. What are his fears? How you communicate this stuff? How you use it? There is a lot of manipulation going on. Um, so I think the most important part for every person who wants to work in analytics or a coach who wants to apply it is not technical stuff. It's not how good are you at math, how good are you with numbers. It's the empathy part. Uh, I don't know if you know this guy. Anybody knows? No. No. This guy, if I go back, I'll try to believe me. Oh, sorry. So here you will see a strange name like from Game of Thrones, Haralabo Bulgaris. He used to be head of analytics at Dallas Mavericks. But the guy started when the analytics movement in late 2000 started. He used data science to predict sports results. So when there was this gap in analytics, they had like data scientists and he won a lot of money. He's a billionaire, basically. Uh, who, won, uh, who won a lot of data by betting, using this data science of betting. And then in, at the end of 2015, 16, he was commenting on NBA. He became quite a popular name, so Mark Cuban hired him. And he was, he claims, I don't know if it's true, that he was behind them drafting Doncic, but they also had Donnie Nelson, who was one of the best, I mean, most connected European guys. So it's, it's a long story. Anyway, doesn't matter. Why I'm telling you this story, 2020, the story came out that he, because he was in charge of the data analytics, that he was really the ones who was making decisions. So they were doing the lineup changes. The playoff series that I was telling you about that Branson didn't play, I don't know if you guys remember, after the, the, the Mavericks started 2-0, 
because they shot, I don't know, 50% from three. And then Clippers, they came back. And in game five, yeah, when it was 2-2, the Mavericks did a drastic change starting Boban and playing Boban like 35 minutes per game and playing zone. I think the, the reason behind was that they knew that they, the, the Clippers was so much better that the only way to win the last three games is playing the odds, like the Kazim. Yeah? We know that he will plant Boban in the paint. The Clippers will get tons of open shots, freeze, but maybe we are lucky in two, three games or the game of seven game series is difficult because the longer you are, the long, more the luck will run out. But that was the strategy. And they won game five like that. And then lost game six and in game seven, I think, I don't know, Marcus Morris shot 40% for free. The, the Clippers, apart from that, the, 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 the Marys couldn't defend. But that was one of the reasons. Yeah? And they say that he was the guy behind and that they made all these lineup changes. Then the article came up in the summer that in one session, in one training session, you know, Luca Doncic showed in the, told uh, uh, Rick Allar when he was pissed off who is in charge of your ball, yeah? because they were telling that he was making these lineup decisions. I don't think that's true. There was also his part of the story where he said it's not true, and I think it's not. But what I think, it was in the end of Carline Ray, Rain, Donnie Nelson's reign, that Carline used some of this lineup data to say players. That's the coach, you know. It's like sometimes when you have to explain the easier, the difficult decision, it's like data shows, lineup data shows, you know. That's why you don't play, you know. Anyway, at the end, they fired everybody. He left, Carlisle left, Donnie Nelson left. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. But what I'm, why I'm telling you this story is, very smart guy. He now owns a club in third division in Spain. They were bought it this year for I don't know how many millions. And they went from last place, they are second now. Applying, he says, I didn't look any player, football player, like football manager, just by data. Very smart guy. But a lot of these guys on the analytics side, I think the empathy, because they're very smart guys, you know, when you talk to people, you're stupid, you know, things like that, there's the problem. And it's also on the other side, the coaching side. You know, you say the analytics guys, you, I know, I know, I forget about basketball in five minutes what you know, you know. So that's why I'm saying most of this stuff fails on a human level, not on a technical level, not on the stuff level. You need empathy on both sides how you talk to players, how you communicate analytics, how you talk to coaches, and coaches need to understand it. We were talking this in the break, there can be a lot of manipulation and a lot of stuff. So this is basically, like I said, and it's not only basketball, it's in business, the same thing. Uh, I can find stats, I can find data to prove you right or wrong, always. How you interpret it, how you understand it, it's a different story. So with this, I'll end. The first part, now we are five minutes early. Uh, you are okay? Um, I think I don't need a mic. First of all, you have to know that this talk is not a professional basketball data first. He is working with his half basketball. That's the first thing what you have to learn from all this stuff is commitment. Again, the commitment, how do you see basketball, how do you love basketball, how do you learn this? This is the first thing how we talk about these things, this is commitment. Without commitment, there is no success, not nothing. And the second thing, what I want you to learn from this is to be open minded. And that's, that, that's the most, and we will do other things. Why this, why that, how I remember it's the 80s when uh, Dusan Ivkovic was coach of the men's national team of Ivestovic was old. I was assistant coach of Vestovic. And I remember we made at that time our personal uh, efficiency points mm -hmm. by walk. Yeah. One point is a basket, one and a half, a three points. Yeah. That's it. Yeah, that's, that's what Dean Smith was doing. Three points. Three points. And we did, and that was it to see who is how, okay. And that's it. 
And that was the success Yanis in our legend, <coughs> Professor Jovic, who played in the Olympics before the triple shots. Yeah. Isn't it what was there in, 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 in the Olympic in, in Seoul in the Olympics and we and the coaches were open minded. And then the most important we can do okay and this what is really really the most important because eventually we can change everything. We can examine whatever we want. Just you have to be open minded. Because I know a million coaches who will say, eh, Ernest so. <laughs> if you talk, yeah, if you talk to Ernest, Ernest said, hey, push. Let, let, hey, looks a very successful coach. Uh, uh, he is multi-practice, he is practicing, he trusts in his work. And when you come, but Spakia, never, you remember that we started with, for, and they worked together in China. <laughs> they, they, were, they, were, they were a team, they were a team, they worked together in China. And uh, Jovan sat in, with them in, in the bubble. With them in the room, and I, um, 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 I, I know the conversation between, yeah. the, between, between them. But okay, this is not the whole basket. Yeah. But if you are open minded, if you are open mind, enough open minded, you will get a million logical things that you cannot right. see. Uh, uh, and to tell you my last sentence, I did my PhD 10 years ago about statistics. And now it's a joke. <laughs> it's it's a joke. How, how we talked we talked before. It's it's a joke. But it's a joke. How we and uh, ten years ago it was a fantastic yeah. thing. How I did about the uh, uh, offensive rebounds yeah. and we talk now yeah. the defensive rebounds. Uh, the, uh, oh, no no no. Now it's very very important. And uh, I think ask now ask now. But I think uh, five thirty and yeah. tomorrow morning we yeah. will do the, the sessions, how I like that we have a conference yeah. after the little groups and after we, you can yeah. use the personal yeah. talk to I want, so thank you. One thing, uh, if I go back, what you said about uh, having an open mind, all analytics, but not only analytics, even in business, like I said, to me, empathy, to understand the fears, everybody around, the surrounding, the context, most important. The second part, what you call open mind, I call curiosity. So be curious. Be, and if you're curious, you will have open mind to learn new things. Yeah. So these are the two things. Uh, we were talking before, and I said, and we talk about coaches who will not use it. I don't know. Doesn't matter. I said my way here from Ljubljana to Pech. Yeah. 15 years, 20 years ago, I would take a map and try to find a way. Yeah. And if I would compete like me. Uh, not a coach, I would compete even now. I have technology, I have data, I have GPS, I have dashboard on my car, how many fuel, how fast I'm going, where I have to turn. I can get here much easier yeah? and much faster. And I know every time of the way where I am. This is basically data. Again, if I compete, I don't know, with the best rally driver or the best car driver, he will be faster than me without that stuff. For sure, that's why the best coaches will still be the smartest or the best coaches. But if you give coach the dashboard, the tool to measure the progress, because what we told about the four factors about all these things, and I will show you tomorrow practically, these are like small metrics that help you understand what happened in the game and the trend of your team. How is your team trending? You're tweaking something. What did we change? Is it really there? This is one thing. The other application that I want to show you tomorrow, it's even more practical in analytics because analytics, it's always, if I go back to this, it's connected with scouting yeah, and preparation. And you can do analytics two ways. You can do top down or bottom up. Top down is four factors leak, what I showed you, okay. We are 25th in the league in defense, 14th in offense, and we are this and this and all that. This is top down. And then you want to drill down. But what these platforms allow you, and I don't know, you see we a lot, uh, allow a lot of mid range shots. Maybe it's a pick and roll defense. We will check our pick and roll data. Okay, we see we are not good at defending pick and roll in drop. The next step, I can get all the clips of this section. So I can see, you always need to understand the context behind the numbers. 
And this is top down. I find something in the data and then I go back to, to see the clips of these actions to see, ah, this is why, maybe. Bottom up is the other approach. I watch a game and I see this guy is not good against drop as a point guard. Maybe one, two, three possessions. Maybe he had a bad game. I don't know. And I go back and I see, do I see this stuff in my data? No. Does it confirm what I'm seeing or not? Maybe. So this is the bottom-up approach. You see something and you try to find the data and get back, you know? And we will try to show you. I'll try to show you all this stuff. Because scouting, and this is with tools like Synergy, typically, if you're preparing for a game, it could take you... I don't know, to watch a lot of games, to prepare the clips, to do, to do, do it through tapes, to watch the game, it can take you hours. But with these tools, it's not even analytics, it's just scouting. You can do it like much better in 10 times less time. And that's one thing, you know, how you get all this stuff. You can watch more film or you can watch the specific things that you want. I want to see, I don't know, when they played pick and roll in this defense with these two guys. Or how did he play it against this defender? So I can get these clips and then I can see. So it's always these two words already mesh, and this you need uh, to have in mind. And as I said, we will try to, um, if I go back um, and then here, Laszlo, maybe we can decide what's the next step. Uh, sorry. So tomorrow, probably. It's better that we close for today. I will show you both these stuff. So for tomorrow, no presentation, no more, more talks. We do practical. We, I'll show you the platforms. I'll show you how you can see this stuff, how it works. And then on the high level, and then you can also see what we can do now. So the things that we are doing based on the data that we have now in Europe. Okay. Questions? Well, I have a question. Okay. What analytics said about no, it's. I will tell you. No, honestly. Yeah, yeah. I. So. It's complex thing. One thing, when we when we try to analyze why Mavericks collapsed after the trade was, okay, their defense was terrible. They couldn't stop anybody. And one of the things was. So this chart that was next to Kevin Durant tweet, my. So what we did, what I did for one of this analysis, we analyzed average size. So even before the trade, Dallas was sixth smaller team. And after the trade, you replace Spencer DVD with 6'5", with Kyrie Eric with 6'2", and they started Hardaway Jr. or Josh Green, who are 6'4", 6'5", instead of Finn Smith, who is 6'7". So basically, they became even smaller. And this is when I tell you when we see the trend. So I will do it. Doesn't matter. I will do it like here. So what we saw when, because, and I will show you tomorrow when we track this four factor systematically, after the trend, this second chances putbacks, it went like this for them in defense. Yeah. So they were like average before the trade, worst. It was because of defense switching. As I said, every switch, offensive rebound, offensive rebound because a small, they were small to begin with. But then, I don't know, Kyrie Irving switched on a 7-7 seven, seven guy. Luca was the second biggest player on the team, and he's not the most athletic, crashing the guy against force. So that was one part. Also on the offense, Dallas, I will show you this just for demo, and we'll go tomorrow. So, so this is now live, this platform. We said uh, league, so four factors, because that, that is really the extreme in this regard. So we say, okay, I will sort by offense. So this is now the best offensive teams. Dallas was sixth offense, yeah? And if you break down, Only half court. Best office in the league, Dallas. Better than Sacramento. Only half court. And this is, I call this the Luca effect, basically. It's, if you watch, I will just duplicate. Um, so these are their 
team stats to it, and I will put it here. Uh, eh, sorry. So, this is his rookie year, but since his rookie year, because they were taken. Half core offense. First, So, best in the league, fifth, second, first. So, since last four years, they are one of the best half horse offenses. Or the best. They were, this year, they were the best. But, on the other hand, last on putbacks, last in transition. So, on offense, they don't run, they don't do putbacks. I think they will never run with him, my opinion. But, because they were so small, teams switched on them a lot on defense. There was a lot of isolation but didn't have a big who could punish them on the offensive play. So they were the teams, and again, this was part of the data analysis that we see, they were the teams, the teams switched the most again in the whole league. So even offense, with that poor defense, they would have to score like better than Sacramento to win the game. So they lost more than, I think, six, seven games after the trade when they scored more than 120. So they needed 130, but for 130, they would need either transition buckets or they would need... Uh, Rebounding and they lost that and defense was really bad. So going forward I think my opinion is very difficult to build a good defense around Kyrie and Luca because they're two below average defenders Especially on ball. So and we see now in the NBA in playoffs You maybe survive with one below average defender or two But you have to have a lead rim protector like Anthony Davis or somebody behind to clean up So it's difficult to me the so Sorry? They did it because of money. Because of money. No, but that was now between us, because as I said, I know a lot of people, even the, like Mark Cuban was the most analytical driven person. He hired a guy who was like, I showed you, billionaire. Make, but now he hired Jason Kidd, who is not a huge fan of analytics. So I think their, their department is a little bit uh, frustrated because they. This, that's what I'm telling you. You can have all the data, but you will still do sometimes things based on... They do it because it, they wanted a star, and no matter the fit. And he was the only star available. Yeah. A lot of things. But what I'm saying, some of the things, the reason why they failed, you can see. So... I mean, obvious. I think the problem was what they had around, yeah? But also by, again, my opinion... So, for example, one, one other thing. For, like I said, they struggle with the rebounding. You can see by Kyrie on-off career data that team always rebounds worse when he's on the floor because he's small, yeah? So, yeah. so you are impacting some parts of your team. Yeah, he needs the ball. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> okay. Last question. For the skeptic, real impact. <laughs> Did we change your mind a little bit? <laughs> that's good, that's good. Yeah. Okay, because all analytics and statistics gives the facts. Mm -hmm. But, uh, and I will tell you at the end what's my point, uh, but it doesn't give any idea how to reach that four factors. So it's up to us coaches. Mm -hmm. Okay, and the uh, problem is uh, I wrote an article about analytics on Serbian mm -hmm. basketball mm -hmm. website, and uh, I noticed the trend. American basketball. Since, okay, I didn't know it's the year 2010. Since that time, production of American players decreased dramatically. Uh, I will tell you mm -hmm. why. Because five or six years ago, or even four, when Kevin Durant was the leader of national team mm -hmm. in America, only Kevin Durant, no one could beat American national team. But now, I think four or five teams in the world can beat American national team. So I don't see production of the players 
since that time and uh, okay. after that stars like Kevin Durant, Steph Curry I don't see now that level of the players Lebron is out maybe this year or next year Tate or Morant but. are not that level for the future and best players in NBA are not raised in but. America and if uh, this is, if uh, this analytics has impact on college but, on, on but so that, that's, that's what you're raising is like the most important question in not in analytics or in basketball in any yes. is what I want to say what I want to say that coach must lead the show yeah. develop the player and this should be just service you know, for sure public, it goes like you said for me it's perfect as a coach I, I lose the game and uh, I say but he told me to do this analytics yeah. no look no, it's just joke. no, no, I understand. But like you said, the service, that's why I'm saying that most department analytics is the service, is the one who provides the data, right, in MBA. Yeah. And so my question is, uh, your opinion about this trend, is it maybe just moment? Or I feel it's... I think you raised, what you raised is like the crucial question, which is not only in basketball analytics or everything, is what we try to see in data is correlation because you see correlation between the rise of analytics and decline of american basketball is correlation really the causation you know what's the difference the most and i'm not uh, saying this to make fun of you or anything it's like there is a correlation between there was calculated in the united states between the uh, sales of ice cream and umbrellas you know the charts were the same are they is there causation? Were they selling more umbrellas because they were uh, selling the more ice cream? No, you know. So I'm not saying that it's not correlation or sometimes, you know. I don't know if that's correlated. That's something that we need to, and it's again, advanced statistic methods try to help you understand this question. To me, what you raised, what I see, it's more complex. I think the American system has a problem with with their, what they call these AAU programs, you know, because they want to build the stars and they play a different way. And what we see, for example, if you go now back, why European stars like Drajan Petrovic struggled, or Tony Kukoc even, and he was same. Imagine a person with a Tony Kukoc skill in today's game, he would be perfect, yeah? NBA changed with this because floor is spaced out, it's more room, so in the, 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 the thing that we saw in the 90s, Indiana, they had like three very tough guys. So it was strength, less skill. Today it didn't change. What it changes, all five players, if you watch the NBA now, the playoffs, I said you, you have a uh, defensive expert. If he's not a skilled player, now they cheat off him the whole game. Today it was, I don't know, Memphis, uh, Memphis uh, Lakers. Analytics department loves Jared Vanderbilt. I don't know if you know his archetype, long prototype, the, one of the best debenters, one of the best offensive rebounders, but he's not skilled. And then you have on the other side. So watch an NBA game. The moment Vanderbilt come in the game, Jaron Jackson Jr., the best defensive player in the year, or on the other side, Anthony Davis is parked in the, under the rim. Nobody's guarding him. So what I'm saying, and it's one, only one guy who is not skilled. In the 90s, in the Indiana, Dale Davis, Antonio Davis, they were not skilled. On New York, you know, they couldn't shoot, pass, dribble. Even Dallas was hit by this because what they did, they built around Luca, they built, built role players who are good at catch and shoot. Yes, Dorian Finn Speed, Maxi Kleber, Harry Hardaway, but they cannot attack closeout. And what happened in the last two years in the NBA? You know, you see a lot of these stampede actions you need to, because defenses are so fast at rotating, there's always rotating, you need to be able to, to drive second, uh, second side attack, stuff like that. So back to your question, we see less of specialized players. What happened with uh, Mori in 2018? You have one star and a lot of specialized players who can shoot. Now this is changing. So again, you need more skilled players. And this is where I think our European system, it's maybe better. You guys know much more about this because we teach, especially in Serbia, 
they teach big men from yeah, to play different positions to to dribble the ball yeah and in america it was more specialized i think for some time analytics this what we saw was favoring this spe specialization so you have a star and five specialized guys but now it's changing and analytics is just measuring this stuff i don't think in some part maybe it was influencing it i don't know but what i think i don't know as i said i'm not such don't know european game in such detail but i think in nba what we see now last two games last two few years we are going back away a little bit from specialization because the the game became so complex and i think this will be will show it this year playoffs that it's even one not skilled player is difficult to play on offense and this is i think the challenge i don't know if it answers your question maybe the truth is somewhere in between that yeah. Može. Ovo nešto vole, vole puno. Idete na ručak. 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 Id